And I have your attention. I want to thank you all for joining the unprogrammed part of our program. <laughs> when I think about the Eurozone, as just about with everything else, it brings music to my mind. And I think about uh, an Irishman, and he sings a song, and it begins with, the more you see, the less you know, the more you find out as you go but I think I know less now than I knew then. As I watch the Eurozone, I think Bono's lyrics in City of Blinding Light pay, play an illuminating role. And I will tell you today, as the president of INET, I'm very thankful for what's unfolding right before me now. In my imagination, I would never have thought that my friend, Giannis, who is a man who is alive. His wife, Dene Stratu, has an art exhibit. Before I think we knew each other, I had seen this online, called Cut. Is it seven lines of different? Dividing lines. Seven dividing lines. And it was a visual show about how fences were used in various places in the world some in Ireland, in Palestine, many other places, to divide people. And when I look at the Eurozone, which when I was a younger man working in the financial sector, I was inspired by the romance of bringing people together. I see people erecting fences now, creating what, something that is very toxic, which I've studied in American studies of racism and the cruelty of that, called otherness. We see otherness, and it is not healthy. And so for me, why am I, despite all of these troubles, experiencing warmth in my heart today? Because of this mysterious good fortune that this man who is artistic, who's married to an artist, who's been a scholar and a friend of INET, now bears the weight on his shoulders of being the finance minister. I'm reminded, as I'm often reminded, of the thoughts of Bob Dylan. <laughs> and he says, pointed threats, they bluff with scorn. Suicide remarks are torn from the fool's gold mouthpiece, the hollow horn. Play wasted words that prove to warn that he not busy being born is busy dying. Temptations page flies out the door you follow and find yourself at war. Watch waterfalls of pity roar. You feel to moan, but unlike before, you discover that you just be one more person crying. So don't fear if you hear a foreign sound in your ear. It's all right, Mom. I'm only sighing. We cannot afford despair. We can only choose to go forward. When I gave a talk at lunch today, I said, nobody likes a naked emperor. We're in the business at INET of moving forward compassionately and designing the emperor's new wardrobe. In the most acute problem on the planet right now, our friend is the chief wardrobe designer for his country. And I'm very excited today that he and our extraordinary Nobel laureate head of our advisory board, and my former teacher, Joe Stiglitz, will be in conversation with Giannis. I remember years ago, when I was a student at Princeton and Joe was teaching, we used to walk home together in the evening. And I said something to him that was something about my rebel spirit and his. And I asked him where he was from, and he said, Gary, Indiana. And I told him I was from Detroit, Michigan. Two places, if you look at, even by that time, are quite devastated. And I said, oh, yeah, we both come from the declining Midwest. I said, Joe, maybe that's why we don't buy the package. <laughs> but the pain and the suffering of our elders and the pain and the suffering of your countrymen is what sticks in your heart and inspires your creativity. So I look forward to the creativity of your work and of your conversation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Rob. Maybe that's a good place to begin. Uh, Anna, this this morning we had a, a session on uh, on Europe, and you mentioned <clears throat> that we had a, a, a moral duty to to save Europe. Uh, that many of us think that it's absolutely uh, imperative to avoid uh, the third major catastrophe in Europe uh, in the last uh, just a little over a hundred uh, years. Uh, I've long had the <clears throat> view that the fundamental problem in Europe is not the structure of the individual countries, but the structure of the Eurozone itself. It was basically flawed from the beginning. Um, and that <clears throat> those flaws were, for instance, uh, had to, while they thought about what was necessary for convergence, they knew it wasn't an optimal currency area, they actually put in place a set of institutions which would promote divergence, that money would go from the weak countries to the strong, and increasing the divide between the weak and the strong. Um, what is necessary, a whole new set of institutions like the, uh, uh, a real banking union done quickly, involving not just common supervision, but common deposit insurance and common resolution, uh, some way of uh, uh, mutualizing debt um, uh, like euro bonds, um, a whole set of new institutions which have been very uh, slow coming. So I guess I want to begin the conversation by by asking whether you <clears throat> whether you share these views, and in particular, uh, given the the slowness of Europe in responding to the crisis that began in 2010, obviously the, when this morning we talked about the enormous number of mistakes that were made. Do you see any strategy uh, that could be put into place relatively quickly without reforming the treaty itself? The simple answer is yes. But before I um, expand upon it, let me thank Rob and very briefly say, times are changing. <laughs> and maybe this is our great hope, I think I'm speaking for Euclid and for my government as well, that the crisis that began in Greece in 2010, threatening the Eurozone with disintegration, uh, the same country may be the beginning of a process of consolidation that will stop the evolution of dividing lines, give, uh, bring to an end this uh, very toxic and dangerous process of turning one proud you know, European nation against the other, and giving rise to uh, a new impetus for integration and unification. Turning to your question, Joe, um, There is no doubt that if we had a federal republic, if we had the United States of Europe, we would not be here discussing uh, the Greek crisis, the Eurozone crisis, banking union, or anything of the sort. I think most Europeans would agree with this. And most Europeans would want to live in the United States of Europe. But as always, as we economists know, it's one thing to, to know which equilibrium you, you want to be at. And uh, it's quite another to, to, to have a theory of convergence or a plan for convergence to that equilibrium. Unfortunately, the way that we designed the Eurozone was crying out for a crisis like this to happen. Some of the founding fathers of the Eurozone, and I'm here uh, referring to François Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl, two pillars of the attempt to bring Europe closer together through monetary union, entertained the notion that they didn't have the political power to bring about the United States of Europe, but they had the power to create a monetary union, which was an old idea from the 1960s. I believe that Giscard d'Estaing actually brought, took it to Bonn in 1964. Uh, this was the first time that it was officially aired. So the idea was you bring together nations within the European Union that have already a common market, you bring them monetarily together, and hope that when the inevitable crisis happens, their successors would make all this, they would take the steps to completing the union politically 
and consolidate. Nicholas Calder, in 1971, warned us in an article in the New Statesman that the opposite would happen. His argument was that if you, if, if you place the cart before the horse, if you bring monetary union ahead of political union, then the crisis of the, pol the, the economic union, of the monetary union, is going to lead to disintegration of the, pol of the political union uh, that we already had in Europe through the European Union. So the, the reason why I'm saying this now in, in the context of your question is that look at Europe over the last few years and ask yourselves, is the politics of Europe more amenable to bringing about the United States of Europe or less amenable? Unfortunately, if we are honest, the answer is the latter. That it's harder now to convince my constituency in Greece that we should move forward with handing over national sovereignty to a federal government. It's harder in Germany to do the same thing. It's harder perhaps in Spain to do the same thing. The crisis has not brought us together closer. And if we open up the conversation about treaty changes and creating a United States of Europe, we will fail. It will take far too long. The discussion is probably going to, to, to be divergent rather, rather than convergent. And in any way, this crisis is going to outpace our moves towards federation. So the question then becomes, and that is how I take your question to um, guide our conversation, can we make changes within existing treaties? Can we redeploy existing institutions in a way that quells the crisis, simulate all the essential aspects of federation and paves the ground for moving beyond the present crisis towards the United States of Europe? I think the answer is yes. And let me just very briefly give you three examples, or actually even four examples. We ha this crisis has uh, manifested in itself in four different realms. One is public debt. The second one is banks banking systems or sectors. The third is investment. We have a serious <laughs> underinvestment crisis or a crisis of investment. And fourthly, in several parts of Europe, not all of them in Greece or in the periphery, we have um, an eruption of poverty, an eruption of underprivilege, of deprivation, and indeed in certain areas, and definitely in my country, a humanitarian crisis. So, can we simulate what a proper federation would have done to tackle this? I think yes. We have several institutions that could do the trick. Then let me give you an example with investment. Okay. Our member states cannot afford to embark upon the public investment that would be necessary in order to kickstart the economy because of fiscal limits, because of Maastricht rules, because of the um, stability and growth uh, uh, pact, and so on and so forth. Nor could they, in reality, especially the ones that need to do it, because they have no central bank behind them, um, and the central bank doesn't have a federal state behind them to back them. So we, th this is a, an, an interesting paradox, but nevertheless. So imagine the following scenario. Imagine that the European Investment Bank which belongs to the European Union, <clears throat> were to be given its marching orders from ECOFIN, from, the, uh, from a summit of our leaders, to embark upon a large-scale investment-led recovery program for Europe. How would it finance this? The European Investment Bank issues its own bonds, has been doing this for years now quite successfully. But it's operating on banking principles, which is a very good thing, and it's fairly conservative, which is a fairly good thing. And it's fearing that if it overexpands its, its, its funding, then its uh, bond yields will start creeping up. But we have another pillar, the pillar called the European Central Bank, which has already decided to embark upon a major quantitative easing exercise. Well, one of the operating problems that the ECB has is to choose what instrument to purchase. We ha we, unlike the United States, there is, no, there is no EU Treasury bill to purchase. But what if the ECB were standing by in the secondary markets ready to buy the EIB bonds, which are Euro bonds? They're bonds issued on behalf of all Europe Europeans. And what if this funding is to be channeled into the private sector of uh, the European Union in a way that simulates 
um, a new deal for Europe. So that's one example of how you can redeploy existing institutions, the ECB and the EIB, in order to do that which Europe really needs to do, to kickstart the economy by creating an investment-led reco uh, recovery program that is financed through what? The public sector, sorry, the private sector. Essentially what you do is you have, you mobilize idle savings which are destroying, <laughs> which are really punishing German financial institutions where, which now don't know what to invest in. You know, you have QE which is purchasing so many boons that there is a shortage of boons in the financial sector of Germany. That's creating problems in Germany. We are not asking for the German taxpayer to fund an investment program in the periphery. We are asking for a smart manner in which the existing institutions can mobilize private idle savings, turning them into the investments in the private sector that can then create the incomes that would then extinguish the private and public losses and debts. So that's just one example. I could give you examples for the public debt, for uh, the humanitarian crisis and so on, how we could use existing institutions, but that would take too long. So yeah. that's no, just I, an example. I think that's a great idea, and, and I, I think that's, that's a great idea, and, and it's very much along some of the ideas that I've been uh, pushing for, for a long time, uh, given that real interest rates now are close to zero or, or, or even negative, and have been that way for a long time, and given the huge needs for investment, uh, uh, throughout Europe, uh, it's really foolish not to be making these high return investments which would pay benefits, uh, yield returns in the long run and also create jobs in the short run and do a, go a long way to, to uh, uh, addressing uh, what is now, uh, uh, you know, six years of, of stagnant uh, European uh, growth, uh, a kind of stagnant growth that really threatens the future potential growth. Um, this is a little bit of an aside, but, but uh, one of the things that I've been involved on, in here at the OECD is the, something called the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress. And one of the things that we've uh, emphasized is that in looking at what's been going on for the last six years, the focus has always been on the liability side of the balance sheet. We haven't looked at the asset side. And when you have the level of youth unemployment that has been going on in Europe as a whole, with 60% youth unemployment in, in Greece, you are destroying human capital and, and undermining the potential for future growth. So it's really, I think, important to have new ideas like this that I haven't seen on the table as well, in the way that they should. Uh, that addresses some of these fun, uh, the pro not only in the short run, but he actually help resolve the crisis. Now, uh, there's been a lot of uh, concern about uh, the the timetable, the the crisis timetable. You know, every th Thursday was supposed to be. I guess today's Thursday was supposed to be one of those crisis days. We seem to have made it through most of the days so far. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit both how you see the time scale and more, more broadly, to, uh, what would you like Europe to do to give you the breathing space and then what would you like to do after you have that breathing space? We were elected on the 25th of January. The next day we faced what I would call an asphyxiatingly tight uh, time frame. Let me remind you that the previous government, I suspect we, we're talking about Greece now, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the previous government had negotiated an extension, a two-month extension of the existing program and the loan agreement until the end of February. So you can imagine, we took over the ministries at the end of January, we had until the end of February to renegotiate uh, what is essentially a five-year program that has not been doing particularly well. Let me put it politely and diplomatically. I have to learn how to be diplomatic. <laughs> so uh, we went to our European partners and to the institutions with a very simple idea. Greece recognizes, the new Greek government recognizes that there is an existing program in train, even though it has been somewhat derailed. It w there was a failure to complete it in good time, which was by December. But nevertheless, there is, every state has continuity, so the new government is bound by the signatures of the previous government. So this is a reality. 
It's a principle that one needs to acknowledge. But there's also another reality. We had an election, and we were elected <laughs> on the basis of our criticism of the philosophy and the macroeconomic logic of the existing program. So what do democracies do when there are two contradictory principles in play? They find a way of finding some compromise between them. This is the whole point about democracy. Uh, so we went to our partners and said, can we find some common ground? Let's extend this uh, period from one month, which is what we had left, to the end of June or sometime that we can mutually agree, during which we can be given an opportunity not to impose, of course, our mandate on the mandate of another 18 member states of the Eurozone, but simply to sit around the table and to think from, from scratch what needs to be done in order to stabilize the Greek social economy and then produce a blueprint for its development from now on so as to ensure that Greece no longer features in the headlines. <laughs> because I know, I understand that many of our colleagues have had enough of discussing the Greek crisis, but I can assure them and you that we've had even more than enough of it. So this is what we, we came to them. Now, what is our... Um, basic idea. Our basic idea is twofold. Firstly, the Greek social economy needs to be restructured very, very deeply. It needs to be reformed. The fact that after five years of the most brutal fiscal consolidation in peacetime, we have flat export growth should signal to all of us, independently of our politics and independently of our macroeconomics, that there was something wrong in the program that was being introduced. So clearly, there is need for reform. The problem, however, with reforms is that reform is a word that resonates in Greece like the word democracy in Iraq. <laughs> Just like democracy is a fine principle and reform is a fine principle, you speak the word democracy in Iraq, people run for cover. Okay? Similarly, in Greece, reform is a dirty word. Why? Why is it a dirty word? Because if you were to perform the following exercise, suppose you were to rank all the cases of rent-seeking behavior, corruption, uh, cartels, oligopoly, um, closed professions, all that, and you were to rank them from the worst case to the least significant case. The program of the last five years of reforms inverted that pyramid and started attacking the least significant case of rent-seeking and leaving the big fat cases of rent seeking completely out of the picture. So when you were, use the word reform in Greece, let's say that I, the Minister of Finance, were to go back to Athens tomorrow and announce that we are introducing reforms. Yeah. Maybe not us because we have been making this narrative, but when the Greeks hear of the word reform, if you're a pension, you think, oh my God, they will cut my pension. If you are a small uh, uh, business person, a small business stroke person, <laughs> uh, you think, oh, they will in increase VAT. It's already at 23%. The problem is, of course, we're not collecting it, but that's another matter. Okay? Um, so we need to give reform a good name again. The only way of doing that is by attacking those vested interests who were standing behind the previous governments and who were supposedly trying to impress upon the rest of society that it needs to reform itself while they refuse to be reformed. So that's one thing we need. We need, in other words, to attack first and foremost the worst cases of rent seeking, the worst cases of uh, corruption, the worst cases of tax evasion, tax immunity, and so on, and then keep going down that list. Greece has to become a reformable society again after five years of failure. Because you know that. When a country is caught up in, in a Great Depression, because this is what we've had, it, it's very difficult to reform. Unless the population owns the reform pro 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 project, unless they can see that there is a plan, a business plan if you want, or a government plan, or any kind of plan, uh, that leads to the light at the end of the tunnel, then they will simply not cooperate. They will see this as a force of occupation, as a force that is working against the society, which is crumbling all, all around them. So, to cut a long story short, we are very keen to sit down with our, and we have been trying to do this, to sit down with institutions and with our partners 
and prioritize the reforms and even create bills that we will push through Parliament tomorrow and have a schedule for these bills and know what we are going to be doing over the next four years, three years, two years, whatever, but not just in the very short run, in the medium to long term, in order to reform society. At the very same time, we need to have a fiscal plan that makes sense. At the moment, Greece is committed to 4.5% primary surpluses for the foreseeable future, when the country has no serious credit circuits operating, and when we are in caught in this depression. Four and a half primary surplus means in the mind of investors, of business people, pensioners, continued austerity, which is self-defeating because debt rises as a result of the collapse of GDP. There was this rumor, by the way, in the second part of the 2014, that uh, uh, Greece was on the way to recovery, that it had turned the corner. It was only a rumor, I'm afraid. I wish it were the truth. <laughs> uh, it is true that real GDP picked up. But do you know why that happened? It only happened because nominal GDP continued following, falling, but not as fast as average prices, which is my definition of a Great Depression. At the same time, investment was moribund and has been now for seven years. So we need to sit down with our partners. Besides the list of reforms, we need to discuss three important variables. One is appropriate primary surpluses, appropriate to the circumstances. We need an investment package that will kickstart investment and crowd in private investment. This could happen in the context of what we discussed earlier with the EIB, for instance, issuing a particular set of uh, bonds for the purposes of funding the Greek private sector. The private sector, and not all of it, but the productive, profitable sector. Do you realize now that there are, I'm sure you know it, but many people don't, that there are profitable companies in Greece, export-oriented, with a full order book, who can't find credit, and therefore they cannot meet demand for their products. Now that needs to be addressed if we're going to grow out of our troubles. So we need primary surplus, an investment package, and uh, a, a serious discussion about our public debt and its structure. I'm not recommending haircuts. I'm recommending smart ways of rationalizing the, both the stock and the flow of Greek debt so as to, in the end, return to our creditors more value than they are going to get now under the, the current regime. So these are the, uh, if you want, two different layers uh, of the Greek government. Now, to get there, to get to this agreement, we had to have this conversation with our partners. And the only way I, and I know that, that, that you can impress upon the other side of a negotiating process that you mean business, that you want to change the, uh, the conversation, is by saying, folks, we are not going to sign on the dotted line of anything you give us just to get the next loan tranche. We are not interested in just the next loan tranche. So, past five years has been characterized by Greek governments of, uh, promising anything just to get the, ne the next loan tranche. So some, uh, even people in here, have asked me, what have you gained except an extension of the loan agreement? Well, what we have gained is some space during which to have the, the serious conversation that we haven't had as a government, as a government, as a state, for the last five years. Yeah, you've, you've raised it. You've raised a, a, a number of issues that, that I hope uh, 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 get into the more uh, public dialogue. The fact that, that Greece is in a deep depression. People haven't been using it. It's not just Greece, Spain. Uh, you know, when you have uh, GDP today per capita lower than it was in 2007 before the crisis, when you have 25% uh, uh, unemployment rates, people in Spain talk about the recovery in Spain. The unemployment has gone down to 24 or 23.8%. I don't call that uh, a recovery. Um, you emphasize the, the, that there's a need for reform in the reform. The word reform is, is sort of an uh, uh, ambiguous term, and, and many of the reforms have actually been counterproductive. Um, there are a couple of things that, that, that you said, I, I think, that uh, also I want to uh, emphasize. 
uh, and that really came back to what I said on some of my introductory comments, that the if you look at the uh, provision of finance to the private sector, uh, especially for SMEs and countries like Greece are all about small and medium-sized enterprises, it's really down. And that's because of the structure of the Eurozone. That's because of this divergent process that I described before of the single market where money leaves, moves out of the, the, the uh, countries that are weak into countries that are strong. And behind any banking system is the government. You know, money in the middle of the crisis of 2008 went to the United States when our banks had proven that they didn't know how to manage risk. Why was it coming to the United States? Because Uncle Sam had written a $700 billion check and said, by the way, if you need a couple more trillion, there's money here. But unfortunately, Greece isn't in the position, and money is leaving the weak economies like Greece. And it's the same thing going on in Spain mm -hmm. and causing private sector contraction that's actually exacerbating the austerity. So it's not just the public austerity. It's the two of these together, and that's why the forecast, if you look at the forecast of the ECB about what was going to happen with the reforms, you see how off they've been year after year after year. You know, any student who turned in year after year after year projections that were that bad, I'm afraid, would be fired. Or, I mean, five, we don't fire our students, but they would get, they fail him. We would fail them. But when you look at the ECB and you look at the, and the Troika and their forecast, you got to say something is wrong with their models. And that goes also to something is wrong with their reform program. Now, one of the things that you mentioned is that they had imposed a 4.5% primary surplus. Mm -hmm. No country's ever had that kind of a primary surplus for the length of time that it was dictated. How did the Greek government, the previous Greek government, sign a program like that? And how could the ECB and the Troika propose a program like that? And one more question. Are they serious about doing that? Have they changed their mind now? I think you need to ask the previous Greek government, <laughs> as well as uh, the, 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 the Troika that imposed it. But no, I will answer the question. I'm not going to um, avoid it. I think it's the politics of denial. The Eurozone has uh, not, to date, publicly, officially, accepted the proposition that its design was not capable of sustaining the shockwaves of the great financial collapse of 2008. So the Greek case is a very good case in point of how an insolvency issue was dealt with as if it was an illiquidity issue and there was an attempt to simply cover it up, to buy time. Maybe we can understand this, but five years later, I think it's now uh, imperative that the structural problems of the, of the, of the Eurozone, the fact, for, in, for instance, that you, you, you have, instead of having a loosening up, you have an enhancement of the reliance on, of banks on states, and states that don't have a central bank behind them in order to bail out the banks and vice versa, of the state relying on the banks for financing. That kind, that nexus, which uh, has proven so toxic in the case of the Eurozone, was meant to have been lessened after Mario Monti's very uh, important intervention in June of 2012 in that summit, that famous summit. What followed? We had a banking union, and yet this banking union was uh, observed in, sort of was confirmed in the breach, not in the observance, in the sense that as we speak now, the SSM is instructing banks in various jurisdictions to avoid purchasing uh, paper issued by the state because it might contain too much risk for the bank, when it is quite clear that if the bank doesn't do that, then the state is going to face risks. And then if the state faces risks, because the bank depends on that state, the banks are going to fall. 
So we are still continuing along the path of pretending and extending, pretending that we have fixed the problem, pretending that we now have the institutions in place that will solidify the Eurozone, when in the end, you know, we haven't done this really. So it is, it is absolutely important to do this. And of course, Greece being the flimsiest part of the edifice, we have absolutely no alternative than to speak these words and, and, and to ring uh, these bells of caution. On the broader question that you're raising about the relation between states and banks, you refer to the United States. Now, of course, the United States, seen from our perspective, is a different universe. Because at least the checks that were written out were backed by the Fed. We don't have an ECB that can do that, even if it wants to. We don't have uh, central banks, national central banks, that can do this. It's a, we can have a very long discussion about the effects of doing it on an inequality, on long-term growth, on secular stagnation, as Larry Summers says, and so on and so forth. But at least you don't have a problem of uh, potential insolvency in the United States as a, as a result of the way in which banks have been bailed out. And finally, I am impressed by the, um, the nature of the conversation in Europe over the last year, two years, three years, in the sense that the crisis seems to me to have taken such a turn that the standard distinction between left and right has been blurred. Because now, let's take, for instance, uh, the British Conservative Party policies in the United, in the United Kingdom. Right? I can have a conversation with George Osborne um, and differences on the efficiency and uh, wisdom of expansionary contraction. Right? But what we're facing in the Eurozone, at least in the periphery, is contractionary contraction. And there can be no argument that contractionary <laughs> contraction is going to lead to growth and to lead to debt sustainability and lead exactly. our country to a situation where we can repay our debts. So, and in other words, now we are in a realm in which we have, on the one hand, those both of the left and on the right who are willing to look at the pro problem afresh and in the light of reason and data. And then there is institutional inertia, which is driven, it's feeding on itself, and which is refusing to come to terms with reality. You may have heard that some of us, uh, especially of this government, have been accused of speaking macroeconomics in Eurogroup meetings. <laughs> that, I think, is quite telling in, on its own. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, just uh, to highlight, you know, there, there's been a lot of focus in Europe about Greece, but in fact, if you look at about the Eurozone as a whole, uh, its growth path relative to where it was, it would have been, you know, going from 1980 through 2008, and you extend that, and you look where it is, that gap is about 17 percent. Uh, the loss because of this mismanagement is now in the trillions of dollars, and the gap, what's so interesting, is getting bigger and bigger. So the policies not only aren't working, uh, to, re to eliminate the gap, the gap is actually uh, get getting worse. So you mentioned macroeconomics. Let me uh, raise a, a broader macroeconomic question that goes beyond Greece, but, but certainly Greece is part of it. Uh, part of the problem in the Eurozone is, is, is that one part of the Eurozone had surpluses mm -hmm. and the other part of the Eurozone had deficits. Mm -hmm. And uh, there had to be a mechanism of recycling those uh, surpluses, the deficits. The way that the Eurozone has addressed this uh, to some extent is been forced the deficit countries to eliminate their current account sur deficits, mm -hmm. uh, not by impre uh, increasing exports, it's basically by starving them so their imports go down. So the adjustment has been on the import side, not on the export side, as you mentioned uh, in the case of uh, Greece. But then you look at the Eurozone as a whole, and the Eurozone as a whole now is contributing enormously to global imbalances. 
the largest imbalances that we've we've had. You know, before the uh, crisis, we talked about we, U.S. bashed China yeah. about the size of its uh, imbalances. Mm -hmm. Now Europe is far worse than China. Right. Now, do you want to uh, sure. discuss this kind of? passing the buck and, and try to beggar the neighbor policy that Europe is engaged in? Uh, now, this is, of course, a central point to the whole design of the Eurozone and to the way that it has responded to the shocks of 2008. Prior to 2008, in the first 10 years of uh, monetary union, because it, in, in reality we began in 1998, not in 2000, the uh, Current account imbalances grew, but they did not result in uh, balance of payments problems within uh, Europe, only because that we, ha we had essentially vendor-financed purchases. So the surpluses that are accumulating in the, surplus, in the banks of the surplus countries were recycled, recycled through commercial banks to the periphery. If you had a symmetric union, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, if you had perfect competition everywhere, as we say in economics, it wouldn't be a problem because those uh, f capital inflows would stimulate investment, then there would be an increase in competitiveness and so on. But, of course, when you had such a tsunami of capital flowing into Ireland, into Greece, into Portugal, into parts of Spain and so on and so forth, what, it tends, to transpire, what tends to transpire is uh, asset bubbles. And then those asset bubbles create a semblance of growth because people start feeling richer, they get credit cards, they buy more Mercedes-Benzers, uh, they import more from China, um, import-export companies, which are really import companies, uh, grow, um, salaries go up, and you end up with Greece having a much higher growth rate than Germany. That was the situation prior to 2008. Uh, and Ireland and Portugal, not Portugal so much, but Spain, certainly. Um, so some countries try to do the right thing, like Spain, which is to pay down debt. But then, at the same time, the private sector debt ballooned. Whereas in other countries like mine, it was the public sector debt that ballooned and private sector debt became, remained very low. But nevertheless, when, the, when, when Wall Street has its spasm, as it tends to now and then, <laughs> and, well, in 2008, we had our generation, 1929, right? Yeah. And then suddenly the credit crunch hits, and when it hits, the bubbles burst, and then the burden of adjustment falls on the, um, on the deficit countries. Now, so what did we do in Europe to compensate for that? We pretended that these uh, bubbles could be refloated when it, they couldn't and essentially extended loans from the surplus countries to the and, and from, from some of the deficit countries to other deficit countries, which was pretty remarkable and pretty um, uncouth. And that, those transfers help only refloat the banking system, effectively transferring losses from the assets of, of banks to, on, onto the, the, the taxpayers, and especially the weakest taxpayers, on conditions of severe austerity, that reduce further nominal incomes in the deficit countries, ensuring that debt sustainability goes out of the window. And then, of course, the central bank at some point comes in, either through OMT, through QE, somehow in order to create, again, a semblance of, of monetary balance. But then the crisis metastasizes from the bond market to the real economy with serious falls in investment of investment in the deficit countries. And now we have this very curious situation in Europe where we went from a situation of this uh, private sector recycling prior to 2008, where the surpluses of the north, if, except Ireland, which is also in the north, uh, the, the surpluses of the, of the core, let's say, were transferred to the commercial banks to the periphery. Okay, and that balanced the books and balanced the current account and uh, financial uh, accounts. We went from that situation to a situation where the surpluses of the core countries are now exported. And you have an attempt to, towards fiscal consolidation everywhere, which can, I mean, this, this is national income uh, uh, identities. The only way you can do that is by 
pushing both the deficit countries and the, the surplus countries of the Eurozone into having a current account surplus. In the case of the deficit countries, as you quite correctly said, this happens through destroying imports, just crushing them through the, the massive drop in aggregate demand, a small export increase by comparison. So these countries either achieve a small uh, current account surplus or um, some kind of balance. Even Greece managed to achieve a balance of, in its current account. The surplus countries remain surplus countries, which means that now Europe is becoming an exporter of deflation to the rest of the world. And the only way of maintaining the balance within is to export it without. And I believe the U.S. Treasury is completely familiar with that and has even issued reports to that effect. Not that whatever the U.S. Treasury issues is correct. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, Europe is not helping in the process of stabilizing the global economy after 2008. And it's not even helping itself because now we have this uh, adjustment within that in a sense cannibalizes a great deal of demand from within the periphery and turns the surplus countries into looking outside Europe for sources of uh, aggregate demand for themselves. And as we know, this kind of economic divergence within the Eurozone doesn't help the progress, the process of reintegrating Europe politically. So let me, no, just let me, uh, first of all, I want to take a commercial break for all of you who are here, and I want to tout a book. It's called The Global Minotaur. It's by a very, very uh, well-known scholar who wrote about these balance of payments problems uh, uh, from, a, from an academic posting somewhere, I think, in Athens, wasn't it? <laughs> Giannis's yes, book is, is very informative on these on these questions. Second thing is we have about five minutes, Joe, and uh, oh, so we're we're coming down the wire. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I was I was going to ask, uh, what luck have you had in explaining to your other uh, finance ministers in ECOFIN about the paradox of thrift? Uh, thrift? Uh, but I, you you don't have to answer that. Uh, that might get into delicate uh, territory. What I wanted to use is the last few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the specific uh, reforms in the reform program that uh, you have in, that you have in mind. There's been some criticism whether you've actually come up with anything. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about about uh, some of the ideas that you've accepted in that continuity, some of the ones you've rejected? You've talked about rejecting, for instance, the four and a half percent primary surplus, anybody in the right mind would have rejected that. And if you hadn't, I would have said uh, you, uh, you didn't listen to any economics professor. Um, <laughs> so would you like to, to comment a little bit about, about that? Yes, By sure. the way, uh, because, because we're in Europe and this is like a soccer game, the referee, that's me, just added 10 minutes to the conversation. <laughs> so he was heading towards a draw, was it? <laughs> Injury time. <laughs> Injury time. Injury time. Injury <laughs> time. Okay. The, by the way, let, let me make it clear that this government is absolutely committed no, never to slip into a primary deficit again because that would uh, simply um, magnify the indignity of the Greek people. And we've had enough of needing to borrow within a monetary union in order to sustain our state. But it's one thing to say we should have a primary surplus. It's quite another to say that we should have a 4.5% primary surplus that will crash the private sector. That's, you know, that's the essence of it. Regarding reforms, uh, we only have a very few minutes. So let me just give you a, a few examples, three examples, just because three is a nice number. Take the case of the labor market, because a lot is being said about our recalcitrance not accepting further deregulation of the labor market. The IMF and various other institutions have certain ideas about how labor, labor markets should be structured. We disagree with them. But beyond that disagreement, what we are trying to convey to our partners and the institutions is that the Greek labor market is the Tea Party's wet dream. Imagine if in the United States somebody were to suggest that only 9% of the unemployed receive any, any unemployment benefits and that only for a few months. I think the Tea Party would have a party on the streets. <laughs> OK? 
Okay? So let me give, and give you another example. 30% of all paid labor in Greece is undeclared. It's black labor, as we say, in Greece, which effectively rules out any chance of pension funds being uh, uh, restructured properly, put back on an even keel. Uh, it has major implications for the tax take of the government. It has major implications even for non-performing loans because some of these people simply have to work under those circumstances and they are not part of the formal economy so they can't even service their loans legally. We have um, a problem with migrant labor, labor that is being treated like dirt by employers who use them and abuse them and which the state can't even get a handle on. So what we really need in Greece is more regulation of the labor market to make it more efficient. So in Greece, even if you are a neoliberal, you have to agree with us that the only way of turning the labor market into a more efficient institution is you need more regulation, not less. Collective bargaining, if it's done smartly, is a good way of creating more efficiency. Now, you don't have to be a left-winger to agree with me. If you care about competition, then you should care about this situation because employers who are doing things by the book are left with a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis others, competitors who employ undeclared labor. So these are the, the, the you know, the, this is why we are demanding a reform program for the labor market which is tailor-made to the conditions of the Greek labor market which has been completely destroyed by the last five years of this great, great depression. And I, I hope you'll, uh the reforms will be consistent with ILO basic standards rather than undermining those standards. Thank you for, thank you for th saying this because in our reform proposals to the institutions, the first thing we say, neon lights, is that we want the ILO to help us design our collective bargaining agreements. In the same way that we say that we want the OECD and we have started and we have embarked upon uh, a collaborative project with the OECD under the auspices of uh, Angel Guria uh, to help us with all the reforms that we are proposing to the institutions and particularly their implementation and monitoring. So that's one example. Let me give another example. Privatizations, which, you know, for a left-wing government is uh, another dead word, word, supposedly. If you look, however, at what we are proposing, what we are saying is that the Greek state doesn't have the capacity to develop public assets. We are, you know, too impecunious to do it. Take railways, ports, a variety, airports, a variety of public assets. Now, what has the previous government been doing in association with the Troika? Fire sales. They, would, they, are taking public, they were taking public enterprises, selling them to the highest bidder, usually one, one bidder, or maybe two. The second was usually fictitious, okay, for a pittance because you can imagine what kind of asset prices we're talking about during a Great Depression. They would take that pittance and put it into the bottomless barrel of the, public, uh, the unsustainable public debt. There would be no uh, commitment on behalf of the bidders, of the privateers, towards developing the, the assets. What are we saying? We're saying that we recognize that these assets cannot be left to the state to manage. We want uh, private public um, uh, joint ventures, we will give management even the majority of equity to the privateer, but we want two things, or actually three things. Firstly, we want to ensure that there is a minimum investment requirement, commitment on, on behalf of the bidder, so as to have developmental long, long, medium to long term effects. Secondly, we want uh, to retain a, a stake for the state so as to have an income stream with which to finance the pension funds that have been depleted through the crisis, through the PSI that uh, uh, attacked viciously their capitalization basis and so on. Thirdly, we want decent working conditions for the workers who work there. So we are restarting the privatization process as a, as a program for making rational use and developmental use of existing public assets. Thirdly, let me give you an, a, a very important example of a reform that we need to effect very quickly and which we're trying to convince our partners and institutions that 
can't wait. Non-performing loans. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the financially stressed Greek state borrowed 40 billion from our partners and institutions to pour into the banks, to recapitalize them. The ECB told us in the recent uh, stress tests, uh, quality assurance exercise, that that recapitalization process worked. We're very happy with that. However, between 35 and 40 percent of loans, remaining loans on the asset books of those banks, of our banks, are non-performing. You only need to re repeat that number in your head to realize that this poses serious problems for the functioning of the credit system. And the more you let this situation fester, the more it eats into the, the capitalization of the banks that the Greek taxpayer has uh, shouldered under very difficult circumstances. Our proposal is for the remaining buffer in the, in the HSF, HFSF, the Hellenic Financial Stability Facility, which is about 10 billion, part of it to be used in order to create a bad bank, uh, a, cap, a capital asset management uh, facility, to cleanse the, 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 the non-performing loans in order to kickstart credit issuance and to stop this process of diminution of the capitalization base of the banks. So these are just some examples. I could go on forever because we, you know, we have a very long list of reforms that we want. But we're very keen to begin implementing them yesterday. The, process, the problem with the current negotiations is that everything is on hold until those negotiations are finished. It, has, it is our considered opinion that that shouldn't have been the case, that we could start implementing reforms, and we are keen to do this while the negotiations take place, reforms that we can all agree on, begin with the low-hanging fruit, and then move on to the higher-hanging fruit. So is there opposition to the idea on the non-performing loans? I'm not sure. There is some opposition. Obviously, some of the people who have non-performing loans uh, don't want to have the loans foreclosed on. The opposition doesn't come from within Greece. What we have is a negotiation process that is dragging out longer than we want. And we don't mind having a full review of the Greek economy by the IMF, by the Commission, by the ECB, by whoever wants to have a look at our finances, because we believe that we believe in transparency and we believe in dialogue. And if there are good ideas about what we should do, we want to hear them, and we want to negotiate uh, a long-term plan for uh, developing Greece and ending this uh, debt deflation cycle. But in the meantime, our view has always been that we could operate at two levels: we could have this review, while at the very same time we could begin implementing immediately legislating through Parliament reforms that are commonly agreed. And I, I know that there is common ground between us and the institutions and our partners that could lead to these bills to be implemented immediately. I am hopeful and I trust that we are going to begin doing this very soon. It is the only way we can restart this process uh, in a way that um, is to the advantage of everyone. Well, I think, uh, thank you very much. I, I think this has been actually a, a spectacular discussion. Um, I, I've I had an opportunity to talk to uh, finance ministers of many countries, and uh, I think uh, there aren't many who uh, come as prepared and as economic, shall I say, literate, uh, it's beyond literacy, it's economic uh, mastery that, uh, that you've shown, and I, I do hope that uh, your negotiating partners uh, listen to some of your good economics, bringing in maybe into the Equifin actually some macroeconomics, as dangerous as that might be, uh, maybe the idea that uh, uh, contractions are contractionary will come to be understood, and that, uh, uh, you know, you, you were mentioning 43 percent of the loans were non-performing. When you have a depression as bad as your depression, of course you're going to have a lot of non-performing loans. And, you know, this is a, a, a there was a famous book, so many of you know, that, that talked about this time is different and talking about financial crises being deep and long. But 
the fact is that you get a financial crisis when you have an economic crisis that is deep and long. So it's a deep and long financial economic crisis causes a deep and long financial crisis, which uh, ex ex exacerbates and amplifies those crises. So hopefully, uh, you and and the uh, eurozone will be able to move out of this, I think, vicious negative circle to a positive circle. Some of the ideas that you've suggested. Uh, some of the ideas that others have put on the table of uh, an investment program, uh, 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 a reform in the structure of the Eurozone that will really get Europe out of the stagnation in which it's been and on a more positive course that would actually achieve the original objectives of the Euro, which is to create a more united Europe. Well, let me uh, call the time card there, and I want to say uh, – First of all, in preparing for this afternoon, I read a very hopeful piece. And uh, a new economic thinker sitting to Joe's left, Jamie Galbraith, wrote a piece, uh, I think it was part of a speech or testimony you gave in Brussels, on uh, a new and more hopeful Europe and, and referred to the case in Greece as well. And in light of that, and in light of the fact that I did not choose to permit a Q&A period with the press today, I thought I would close with another musical lyric <laughs> that uh, inspired me uh, from some of the words that I heard from our, our Greek finance minister. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen and keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon, for the wheels still spin and there's no telling who it, that it's naming. For the loser now, will be later to win, because the times, they are a change. They are a change. <laughs> Thank you. Last note, the, uh, while we did not have a Q&A, the whole session, which is recorded, is on the record, and uh, Minister Varoufakis has kindly uh, agreed, along with Professor Stiglitz, that uh, anything that was said today is fair game. Thank you.